I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, genealogy, family history, it's boring. Nothing ever exciting happened in my family. But you never know. Watch today's video why I interview Mark Basarach, and he talks about some of the fascinating stories that are deep in his family history that he wasn't aware of until he started digging. And stick around to the end of the video to find out more and find out how you can start looking into your family history. I'm Mark Basterash, Um and really, I guess if we want to talk about genealogy, um, we can start with my last name. My last name is kind of what sparks the interest in this conversation. And uh, when I started digging in, I found a whole bunch of interesting stuff, so it just kind of sucked me in. So uh, what really got me interested in genealogy was I, uh, I'm i Acadian, um, this is my ancestry, so that's my background. Grew up in southwest Nova Scotia, so okay. in uh, the municipality of Clare. Well, for most of my life, I was curious as to what this name was that I kept signing. With the, the handle of Bastarash, I started noticing it didn't really fit in. Just curious what it was. I heard all the, the jokes, of course. I might as well start with that because, you know, you ask somebody and they'll say, oh, it just must just means bastard child. Or So I thought, well, that's possible too. So all my life I was really curious as what it really was. And then, of course, this wonderful, wonderful invention of the Internet shows up. And the flow of information starts going, so I was able to start looking into it over the last few years. I discovered that uh, in the just in the name itself, there was an amazing story of arrival and survival, I guess. The story starts with uh, um, a man named Johannes, um, who was from the Basque country, who ends up in Acadia in 1681. We don't know exactly how he got here or why he got here. Um, those are things I still need to, I'm trying to find. But we do know that he shows up in 1681 um, at the age of 23 or 24 years old. From, from the, the Basque, Basque country. country. Now, the, the Basque, Basque country doesn't, doesn't exist, exist anymore. anymore. So it exists, existed basically between, on the border between France and Spain. Johannes, Johannes Basque, um, as he was known in the first times, because um, he didn't have the name of Bastarash necessarily right oh. away. Johannes, Johannes Basque, um, as he was known in the first times, because um, he didn't have the name of Bastarash necessarily right away. But yeah, so he shows up in Port Royal in 1681, um, gets married that year um, to Anne Gada, um, and immediately starts having Catholic children. The British siege of Annapolis, I think it actually turned hands, I think, a total of 10 times. Yeah. He's still buried there in the, uh, in the, old, burial, in the old cemetery. Okay. Um, unmarked grave. The Acadians didn't uh, have value enough to have marked graves. His oldest son, first son, was named Pierre. So the Acadian deportation is a, uh, basically it's a six, if I'm not mistaken, well from 55 to 63, so yeah, so it's a few years of, of tumultuous times there, but um, <clears throat> To describe the deportation for people that don't aren't com completely familiar with it is the this region of the Maritimes, what we consider now Nova Scotia, Cape Breton, PEI, New Brunswick, even parts of Maine and into the Gaspé, um, were hotly contested between a few groups of people. Um, most commonly, you'll hear English and French, the British and the French, um, but we have to include the other people that were here mm -hmm. before those people showed up which is the native populations, largely the Mi'kmaq, and uh, what became the Acadian people. Um, the Acadian people didn't, weren't, weren't like made overnight. They, they evolved into this, this population that was separate from the French, and separate from the Mi'kmaq, but unique in their own existence. Um, as you get past the 1730s, the tensions between the French and the British become really tight. So, they're fighting over this this part of the world. Um, basically, it's it's part of the New England expansion. And the New England colonies had a hard they they weren't able to move west over the uh, over the uh, the Appalachian Mountains. So their best option was to move north. And there was this um, French sympathetic Catholic Mi'kmaq friendly population that was in the way. The New England expansion <clears throat> we had to displace them. Uh, so this is what we talk about the deportation. So to get back to the Bastarash and Johannes in his earthly paradise with his young children and his son Pierre and his wife Anne, um, how does he end up through this story? So at, at one point he ends up in and around Sackville, New Brunswick today, which was the uh, the community of, um, of Beaubassin. Amongst a bunch of others, um, a lot of this had to do with getting away from the British, like I said, 
and crossing over into a more French-controlled, Acadian-friendly territory. Old Jean doesn't get there. He dies in, if I'm not mistaken, 1724 in Annapolis. His son Pierre, the eldest, ends up um, in Beaubassin. Now at this time, we're into the 1730s and 40s. It's getting tight, it's getting tense. Um, the British are putting pressure. Um, there's whispers of displacing these inconvenient French Acadians. He has a son who he names Pierre as well. So there's Pierre Jr., Pierre II. And in the years leading up to the, the final decision in 1755 to effectively displace this entire population, um, at some point, Pierre and some of his compatriots, some of his friends, which uh, we, we know in, in Acadian folklore, in the history is uh, like the, the Broussard family, uh, uh, there is a, a resistance to uh, to the British forces um, that's that's actively put together. Sympathetic to the French, he was, uh, but they wanted to keep Acadie the way it was. So Pierre II, his brother Michel, and a bunch of others in the Beaubassin area um, put up a big fight. And uh, in the spring of 1755, um, Pierre II ends up being taken prisoner, I guess, for, for a better way of saying it, um, in the Beaubassin area. And he was taken prisoner with what they think, what, how did they call it? With some of the most unruly and most dangerous um, enemy is what they, they said at the time. They were imprisoned in Fort, uh, Fort Cumberland, which was renamed Fort Cumberland after um, the British took over. It was Fort Beausejour before that. So after 1755, after the siege and the fall of Fort Beausejour, Pierre II is taken prisoner. Um, they are immediately put on one of the transport ships um, for fear of, 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 up, of an uprising. And it was sent to the furthest colony south as possible. They wanted them as far away from here. So they sent them to Charleston, South Carolina. And that was in the fall of... Uh, 1755 in October. <clears throat> Once this group of unruly Acadians gets to uh, South Carolina, it's a little unclear whether, because there's mixed stories. The governor in South Carolina didn't want these prisoners. He's like, why did you send me these prisoners? I have trouble. Now what am I going to do with them? So some were released, were given free passage um, to do what they want. Um, some escaped. I'm still drilling into the story to see if these ones were given free passage or if they were allowed to escape. So in the spring of 1756, um, Pierre the Senior ends up setting off on foot with 15 compatriots, 15 people, um, and they want to come home. Now we're talking from Charleston, South Carolina, 1756, in the middle of a war between the French and the English. So... Uh, they set off on foot in the spring. So that's, they have to cross through South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, the state of New York, and they eventually get to the shores of Lake Ontario. Um, unfortunately, cross paths with a group of um, British-friendly Mohawk natives. They were taken hostage. The group was taken hostage, tortured. Two of the people in the group died because of the, of the wounds inflicted on them. But there was a fur trader from Quebec that either was summoned or happened upon this group, um, he was able to negotiate the ransom that the uh, that their captives were demanding. So now they're free, but they still have to get back home. They were looking for their wives and their children, but they were left behind in all of this. They didn't get on a ship. When they were finally freed from their captives, they, uh, they were able to use the canoes from their rescuer, and they made their way back to uh, La Mer Rouge, uh, the Red Sea, which is known as the Northumberland Strait. There, they heard whispers of refugee camps, one of them on Ile Saint-Jean, which is currently today's Prince Edward Island, and the other refugee camp that was set up that they heard about was on the Miramichi. It was run by a, a commander, Boisebert, um, out of Quebec. Pierre and Michel had heard about these two refugee camps and that there was thousands of Acadians here, that, that, that they were in horrible condition. Um, France lost the war. Sorry to break the, you know, it's a spoiler alert, but. And they find their wives. 
Michel um, finds his wife on PEI, Prince Edward Island, and uh, gathers his children and his wife and ends up back in New Brunswick, on the shores of New Brunswick. And Pierre um, founds, finds his wife Anne and his children and his little son, Isidore, um, at Boza Bear's uh, camp in the Miramichi. Now, I mentioned the son Isidore because Isidore was born in 1752. So it's three years before this, this time, three years before the deportation. So I, I, can't, I can't help but imagine what it's like to be a, a three-year-old running away from the home that you know. Your, your father is put on a prison ship, sent off to God knows where, whether or not you're going to see him again. Who knows? Uh, cannon fire, the ships in the, in, the, in the basin, people running everywhere. Everything's unknown. So what did Anne and her little son Isidore go through? I can only imagine. If you want to find the, the stories that are hidden in your family tree, like Mark had, make sure you join us every week on Saturday night for the Genealogy Happy Hour, where we discuss all things genealogy, from DNA to family history to writing your family story to what software is best to use. Issues that you m might have in getting started or in continuing. Uh, every week features a, a, a Q&A section where you can ask your questions. And from time to time, there'll be guests dropping by. Full interview. In the meantime, to watch the rest of Mark's story, make sure you click here to watch the full video. And if you want to hear another great family story, click here for my interview with Jamie Bailey as he talks about his family and how they came over here as part of the Highland Clearances.